Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining today's live session on AI for Good. My name is Natalie Buckland, and I'm the Program Manager of Data Robots AI for Good program. And I'm Sarah Cutry, a data scientist with Data Robots AI for Good program. Together, Natalie and I will be moderating this great panel. In 2019, Data Robot launched our AI for Good program. We received dozens of applications and in, ended up selecting five participants. Today, we're joined by two of our participants and our partner, Global Giving. As a reminder, we're currently applications, currently accepting applications for the second round of our AI for Good program. You can apply by following the link in the event description. Today, we'll be discussing the opportunities and challenges of implementing AI solutions in the nonprofit sector. We'll also discuss our participants' projects and how they made use of AI at their organizations. To get started, we'll begin with a round of introductions. I'll ask everyone to share their work in the nonprofit space, a bit about their organization and the project they had for the AI for Good program. Let's get started with Pradeep from Kiva. Yeah, hi everyone. <clears throat> My name is uh, Pradeep Ragotaman. I head up data science at Kiva. Uh, Kiva is a nonprofit that was founded in 2005 um, to provide um, crowdfunded microloans to underserved ind individuals globally. Um, so basically, what it does is it's a platform that connects individuals like you and me who have, let's say, as little as $25 to lend to somebody else and uh, connecting them to individuals across the world who don't have access to that um, capital uh, from the formal banking sector. Um, so our mission is basically to expand financial access um, to help underserved communities thrive. Uh, and today we kind of expanded beyond the crowdfunding platform to address financial inc inclusion on a bigger scale. Uh, so for example, using blockchain technology to create an open source digital identity system. Um, and then in terms of uh, our work with Data Robot, um, what we um, worked on was a project where, um, so stepping back a little bit, so we've, we have like loans that we put up on our website, right? And then we, we have lenders who come and like uh, crowdfund the, those loans. Um, so not all funds, uh, not all loans kind of uh, crowdfund at the same rate. Some are very popular, they get shown to our lenders, they get funded but there are other loans that don't get funded. Um, so our goal with Data Robot was to kind of try to identify these loans that don't fund or are not likely to fund um, and then surface these loans up to our lenders so they can actually get funded. Um, so yeah, that's what we kind of worked with uh, in collaboration with Data Robot. Great, thank you for that Pradeep. Nicholas, would you like to go next? Absolutely, yeah. So um, uh, my name is Nicholas Stewart. I'm a data scientist at uh, Virtue Foundation. Virtue Foundation is a uh, nonprofit um, that was established over 20 years ago now, uh, and has been conducting medical missions uh, in the developing world and underground, providing healthcare and assistance uh, throughout the years over a variety of countries, and. Um, a couple of years ago, the foundation basically put together an initiative, uh, a data initiative to create actionable tools for volunteers and for organizations based on the observation that there is many inefficiencies in the, um, in the world of healthcare and uh, in, the, in the, the allocation of resource and funds uh, for organizations. And that there was, there was a huge opportunity to actually lubricate the market and with the same amount of funds like create more good um, and like reach, uh, target more people effectively on the ground. Um, so we've worked with Data Robot for about a year now, building uh, solutions to uh, create a granular compendium of healthcare organizations. Where are um, the organizations on the ground? What do they do exactly? Uh, where are the healthcare facilities? And which organizations are connected with which healthcare facilities? So uh, there is no, uh, source of truth or like universal uh, ground truth for that data. And so uh, a lot of a lot of the work currently has to do with putting that uh, that compendium together and this is what we've been uh, what what data robot helped us achieve uh, in uh, multiple ways. Great. Thank you for that Nicholas. Nick, could you finish us off? Sure. Thanks, Natalie. Hi, everyone. My name is Nick Hamlin. I am the Director of Data Science and Analytics at Global Giving. 
Global Giving is a nonprofit ourselves. We were founded about 19 years ago at this point, and our mission is to help fellow nonprofits get access to whatever it is they need to create change in their communities, whether that's access to money, information, ideas, networks, whatever they need to do their job better, that's what we exist to help them get access to. Uh, and one of those uh, key types of things that we help connect uh, nonprofits with is corporate partnerships, uh, just like the Data Robot AI for Good program. We are uh, fortunate enough to get to work with the Data Robot team in setting this program up in 2019 and now again for round two in 2021. Um, it, beyond our corporate partnerships, uh, we do lots of different things, uh, everything from uh, crowdfunding, you can hear more typical crowdfunding uh, offerings for nonprofits to vetting and grant making uh, all the way through to disaster response and recovery. Uh, it really does run the gamut, uh, but the theme that cuts through all of that is the idea of transforming the aid and philanthropy sector through accelerating community-led change. That idea of putting those closest to the problems in their communities, uh, putting them in the lead of solving those problems, that's at the core of our mission and that's the core of what we seek to do every single day. Oh, well, thank you. We're so excited to have the three of you here today. So to open us up, to open us up we're just going to ask, what would you say are some of the unique challenges for nonprofits regarding the adoption and use of AI as a technology? Oh, well, I can dive in there. Um, I think one of the things that is challenging about uh, the adoption of AI and, and technology uh, certainly in the social sector, but I think also just everywhere is at a basic level, how do you get the right data to be able to train the models and build the uh, machine learning implementations with? Uh, as, as many of you, as I'm sure all of you listening in uh, have encountered at home, the, that has such a great effect on the kinds of results you're able to get, the conclusions you're able to draw, the inferences you're able to make. And Data collection can be really expensive. Uh, most nonprofits don't have a giant data engineering team to build these really rich pipelines and uh, ga you know, constantly gather information from all the places they might want to ideally gather it from. And so there's, I think, a balancing act that has to happen uh, for particularly nonprofits that tend to have smaller teams, smaller budgets, uh, to be able to make sure that they have the right data coming in the door in order then for those machine learning implementations to be really high yield and sustainable over the long term. Uh, I'd love to hear from, from uh, Pradeep and Nicholas if, if that kind of resonates with your experience. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, like a lot of, a lot of what we do uh, is centered at least in the first stage about around getting quality data. So like getting Getting the da data, like assembling a, a viable data set is evidently um, a challenge and it depends on like the resource you have. And when, when, when dealing with like low income countries, like the data is often scarce. So like you have like limited sources available. You have to compose with like local governments, data that's like available um, on the internet and, and put that together. And I would say that's like 80% of the work. And when you get there, you don't yet have like a machine learning uh, solution. And this is where like data robot was helpful for us in like just like speeding through building an efficient model and then like deploying it, having something from like historical label data to production in basically no time. And then being able to iterate on top of that, bring in new data. Um, and we basically were able to, to like, uh, I think move the project forward uh, thanks to um, the, the solutions that data robot provides in terms of just um, speeding up and going from the data we had to a solution that enabled us to actually meet a uh, publication deadline last year. Yeah, and I don't have that much more to add. I think they put, I think I can kind of think about like what problems do nonprofits have. I think probably all the problems that like for profits have uh, with the additional constraint of like just resourcing, right? So the idea of, hey, you've got to identify the right problem, you need to have the right data, you need to be able to clean it, like cleanse it, do all those things, and then build a viable product quickly, right? So you can go out there and test and do those kinds of things. So yeah, so I'll just leave it at that. I think uh, yeah, nothing different from any other kind of for profit company in some sense, with, with 
with the problem of like uh, resources for sure. Yeah, that's that that's really well said. I, I think the that resonates with my experience as well. That the problems aren't necessarily different, but they can be magnified. They can be compounded by the kind of scale and complexity of the problems that we tend to work on, as well as the resource constraints. Uh, another one that uh, something you said reminded me of as well is that just talking about some of these uh, some of these technologies, uh, you know, what can you do with a machine learning model? Uh, if if you're if you're operating in the social sector, it's pretty typical that you might encounter people that have maybe less comfort, less familiarity, uh, less background in, you know, what does it mean to even train a machine learning model in the first place? The idea of, you know, training versus testing versus validation, all that jargon can get kind of hard to wrangle, especially if that's not something you're used to. And so just even talking about machine learning and AI, uh, broadly as well as with decision makers and stakeholders, I think is, is another challenge that is compounded uh, by kind of the unique operating environment of the social sector. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, you know, machine learning, AI, it's a very technical field and translating that, uh, you know, technical jargon into uh, a way that non-technical folks can understand is often a challenge in and of itself. Um, to the group, how have you tackled that problem? How have you tackled having to explain often, you know, mathematical and, and technical things to uh, different non-technical audiences? So th this is definitely um, something that I think as data scientists, we have to do every day, right? Because on projects like you're like inevitably gonna interact with technical people, people from other fields and like, for our case, like for instance, healthcare, right? So like dealing with doctors, dealing with uh, medical professionals that like obviously are like scientists, but don't necessarily have like um, a data science background. So there is similarities between the two, right? I mean, when you conduct like, um, uh, when you conduct like a trial for, for a drug, for a, a new, um, a new medicine, or, or when you, when you want to assess the accuracy of the treatment, that there is like, uh, I mean, the efficiency of a treatment, there is like basically a parallel with that, between that in my experience and um, a machine learning model and the metrics you usually care about, which which, which makes it like uh, uh, translatable to, to at least pe people in the medical field without necessarily uh, uh, a background in machine learning and, um, and data science. I think, yeah. oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, go ahead. I think the, uh, another thought that that makes me, that reminds me of is that that communication challenge goes in both directions. It's not just that there's technical users and there's non-technical users and the technical users have to figure out how to communicate all of this jargon to everybody else. I think particularly in the social sector, given the kinds of uh, well, social, uh, adaptive challenges that we're seeking to solve, it's equally important that those working on the technology side of that puzzle are actively listening and trying to engage in the jargon of the problem that's coming into us to inform how we think about those model building, uh, those, those mo like modeling and the infrastructure, everything that goes into that. Uh, otherwise, I think it's very easy to wind up in a situation where we may have built some really cool model that uses some fancy algorithm uh, but wind up either optimizing for the wrong thing, solving the wrong problem. And so maybe I, I would even expand it to, to say, you know, communication between uh, domain experts and technologists kind of on an even playing field, uh, not, not to put one above the other is I think very important. Yeah, I second, I was gonna chat a little bit about that actually. I think the idea of actually defining the problem correctly in consultation with your stakeholders, like non-business, like the non-tech people actually, the idea of like, hey, this is the problem we're trying to solve. Um, and then maybe an additional step um, is kind of like getting some like data and just some analytics around it just to build an intuition, right? Around here is the problem, here's how big it is. And then um, diving into a model or something is probably the right sequencing. I think to, to Nick's point, the idea of just kind of communication between the, the, the technical and the non-technical folks right from the beginning before you write, write a line of code, I think is like really, really important. 
And that goes hand in hand with Nat Natalie's original question of just how, what are some tricks for doing that effectively? Even just like you said, before you jump into building a complicated model, uh, a SQL statement with a group by goes a long way to illustrating, hey, here are the interesting subcategories that might exist in this data set. What should I do next? Uh, being able to have those concrete artifacts to point to to facilitate those conversations, uh, I think you're right, is super powerful. Yeah, great. Thank you, everyone. Um, so I wanted to ask a related question. What are the key, in key ingredients to a successful application of AI in the nonprofit space? Um, each of you have experience implementing different solutions in the, in the nonprofit space. What, what do you think has made your project successful? The, the ability, I think, to, and this is basically connected to what we were just saying, to um, show the usefulness to different stakeholders, right? The ability to, um, to to define the problem properly from the start and to iterate on that, right? Because when you, there, there is like domain specific knowledge that uh, that that non technical people or like non data science people may have that uh, the, the data team does not have. So like just being able to synchronize and understand each other uh, on like what the problem is, uh, and so okay, so this is our our assumption of the problem, right? But then you have people personally, I mean, I work for um, a medical nonprofit. I'm neither a doctor and I've never been uh, on a medical mission on the ground, right? So like there are people that have more insights into what can be useful, like what you, what we can build and deploy out, out there or at least have an intuition for it. So like what, what can make the most um, impact on the ground? And, the, and this is kind of like a high level idea. And then basically taking that high level idea putting it like laying it down and saying, okay, here is technically speaking what we can potentially do. This is going to be easy. This is going to be hard. And like iterating in that process, I think is like how we, uh, we created a lot of value so far. Yeah. And I would just kind of like disagree with that. I think then going back to the problem that we were trying to solve, like, so here are these loans that um, we think don't fund as quickly or don't fund and how do we kind of get them in front of our lenders? The first thing is to kind of like, what are these loans? I mean, like, the, like to, to uh, Nicholas's point, I mean, the, the business stakeholders, they have a lot of like insight and have anecdotal evidence around like what works and what doesn't work. And so I think kind of like going from there to kind of looking into the data and generating those kind of like plots and insights to say, okay, hey, it matches up with this. Oh, we found something surprising is, is the first step. And then um, discussions from there then kind of lead to uh, more complicated solutions like say machine learning and such. I think what I would what I would add to that is coming back to the theme of uh, the social social sector operations tend to be smaller, leaner. Uh, you know, maybe don't have access to millions of dollars of VC funding, things like that that tech companies tend to have access to. And so, spending a lot of time thinking about what are the problems that we as a data team at a nonprofit are uniquely suited to solve better than some replacement data team. For example, one of the problems that is not on that list is a lot of you know novel machine learning algorithm generation. You know, for example, like or uh, you know automatic machine learning. That's the kind of task that we will delegate to the data team at Data Robot. Uh, like that's what you all do. That's that's what tons of people are spending their entire working days focused on, they are going to do a better job solving that problem than me and my small team at Global Giving are. And that makes sense because that's what they're focused on. So it doesn't really make sense for us to focus on those kinds of problems that other teams are uniquely, are better suited to solve and have resources available that we can then pull in. And so to whatever extent we can, uh, we like to use, you know, open source tools, third party products, third party APIs are particularly useful because then, you know, we can just kind of implement the connections between all of those. And instead of focusing on a lot of then nuts and bolts work that we would need to maintain, we're able to really maintain a laser focus on the problems that sit solely in the intersection of our technical expertise, as well as our domain expertise uh, and the relationships that we have with our partners. And that kind of prioritization 
have, I think has been really valuable on the machine learning pro projects that we've done that have turned out to be successful over the long term. And a couple of you have, have hinted on this point that domain expertise uh, is really required, especially when you are dealing with um, you know, a lot of the issues that nonprofits have. So I'd like to ask, how much do you think that domain expertise has really benefited you and helped you solve some of those tough challenges? Um, I would, uh, yeah, go ahead, Nicholas. Yeah, the, so I, I think so the, the challenge, at least for us, right, was to um, somehow summarize like, all these, I would say, almost grievances, like from like people that went, like conducted medical missions on the ground, and realized the inefficiencies, and realized, okay, we, if if like we could make like local NGOs or like NGOs in in the, in the greater region of um, of a given country aware that like there is a road that connects like this village to the only hospital in the area uh that is damaged uh and that like you know with like very few resources compared to the grand the grand scheme of resources available in, in the nonprofit world you can fix that road and like reconnect those people and potentially save lives uh if only we could like let the word out and so this is just one example but this is basically what it what it resembles in a lot of ways it's like just a bunch of observations about the inefficiencies and and like our job is to turn that into a product to listen first to discuss, to make a proposal, and to iterate on that until we can come up with like a platform that somehow solves these issues. Uh, but th but the, the the domain expertise and and the experience is required here because there's just so many things that you know you, you're you're a data scientist, you're you're working in front of a computer. You don't have the you're not on the ground right now. You know, so you need to work with people that know and then have that insights to realize like what can be useful and just there are sometimes super low hanging fruits that just enabling organizations to promote opportunities like smaller organizations that may not necessarily have like a huge uh, um that, that'd be super tech savvy or like have sometimes just a very simple website or facebook page just enable them to to promote like opportunities or um connect them with with volunteers like it's, it's, it's sometimes super low hanging but can make a huge difference yeah, and I, I would just, again, yeah, just add that, so in the end, like you're trying to solve a business problem in using machine learning, right? So I think the idea of like understanding the business makes sense. And I would mm -hmm. just generally kind of think of, it's it's probably true for any kind of like, um, like let's say engineer, or like you know, it doesn't matter what you do, but especially like for a data scientist, I think putting on a product manager hat, uh, kind of call it, is kind of like important. Kind of think about the product you're building and the problem that you're trying to solve. And therefore understanding the business and the uh, having that, at least getting some understanding of the domain and you may not become an expert, but like having enough to kind of understand that you cannot solve the right problem, solving it the right way, and you know, understand what the implications of doing something are. Uh, I think that's really important. I, I, we were just talking a few minutes ago about jargon and how that can be challenging. And I realized like we've been talking about this idea of domain expertise. But like, what does that actually mean? I, I think there's there's a couple subcategories in there that are really relevant to doing this kind of work well in this space. One of them is is knowing kind of the broad context of the problem, you know, enough to be able to interpret the columns in your data set and things like that. I think another important element is not necessarily knowing all the answers to stuff, but knowing being able to know when you don't know something, and then can turn around and say, okay, now I need to go and find someone who can help me with this or I can you know know where to go and look it up uh, and being able to kind of have your have your head on a swivel at least to be able to identify potential pitfalls even if you don't necessarily know the nature of what those are going to be the third thing that I would add that I think is, is important here is it's not just about knowing stuff it's also about knowing people because ultimately we're, we're doing the work that we're doing in service of human problems and so having relationships, maybe not necessarily direct relationships, but indirect relationships uh, with the people for whom you are, or with whom you should be building those models. Uh, that to me, I think is, is, is really critical. And, and whether that's people at your company, uh, people you know, that your organization is partnering with, people that you seek to serve, 
those relationships can take many forms, but I think it's really easy to get caught up in the idea of domain expertise in the abstract without zeroing in on like, what does that actually mean and who does that actually refer to and how can we get those people who are actually real much closer to the problem I'm trying to solve than me engaged in that conversation to inform my thinking. Great. Thank you, Nick. Um, so I wanted to ask a follow up question. What would you say is the importance of understanding the groups that will be affected by the results of the prediction? Because at the end of the day, um, the goal is to produce uh, some sort of uh, prediction or uh, decision about uh, a situation and take action on it. And especially in the nonprofit sector, I think understanding the effects of the solution you're coming up with can be can be very important. Um, so I wanted to pose that question to a group and get your thoughts on that. Uh, I mean, at the risk of sounding a little like a broken record, I think that's exactly where those relationships can come into play. In, in terms of ensuring, not just like as, as, you know, at the beginning of the machine learning process, but as, you know, as the model's being deployed, as it's being used in perpetuity, there's got to be ways for those affected by the model to provide feedback. There's got to be ways for the people who are in charge of maintaining that model to stay on top of the externalities that those models are creating. I think the, the question that you've raised, Natalie, is really kind of one of the central challenges of doing not just machine learning in the social sector these days, but machine learning, period. Um, and, and as we are kind of gaining a broader understanding of the kinds of ways that those uh, second and third order effects can manifest, that's a really big challenge. Um, I'd love to hear from, from others on the panel as to how you've kind of thought about that. I completely agree. I mean, I, I think this is not uh, specific to to nonprofits, right? But you 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 some somehow I want to I think you phrased it well, like to basically like enable feedback from those affected uh, by your model in some form or another. In in our specific use case, like you, we 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 used so far we use machine learning mostly for uh, data curation. But the outcome is effectively to select organizations, which also means like to exclude the organizations that um, uh, that that we, we we think are not um, relevant. You know, like most most of it most of it like is uh, effectively uh, noise, right? So we have to like make uh, to to basically like find nonprofit organization, healthcare nonprofit organizations, which is a subset. So that involves like excluding basically what is not in that uh, realm. Uh, so the, the, we couldn't just like blindly like uh, run a model and get, get predictions and uh, expect things to be perfect. That's like been our experience actually. Like we realized like last year when we were uh, somehow like halfway through the, the first, um, our first like 24 list of low-income countries for which we were curating the data that we had missed like um, we need to expand the scope. Like we needed to basically capture more organizations because we, we had missed some uh, important pieces of the puzzle and so that's this idea of like iterating to uh, to to um, enhance the quality of the data um so we took a step back and like we're just expanding the the, the breadth and we 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 we, in, we we had to also like in conjunction not just with like a model but to also factor in like uh, uh review by people like we like review by people to just like understand like at a more granular level what our organization does and like we were able to like um, specifically, assess, like like target people to uh, assess like organizations that were a little bit ambiguous, right? For which like uh, a model wouldn't have a strong confidence. Uh, those organizations we we considered it like critical for a person to look at to um, um, not just like to have like a uh, a, a binary uh, inclusion exclusion, but like r rather like have a confidence threshold and then just look at uh, those organizations individually, which took time, but in the end, I think, enabled to really increase the, the quality of the, the compendium on, on which we're, we're building like future like uh, resource and volunteer matching applications. So I think this is critical. Yeah, I, sorry, Sarah, go ahead. I was gonna say, I think that's a great anecdote for the role that domain expertise manifested in practice can look at. You know, in this case, 
the human expertise acted as a bit of a guardrail against, you know, an AI prediction that may have simply been some binary yes or no, this belongs or this doesn't. Um, and you found a way to triage those and direct them to your experts. You were going to say, pretty. No, I think um, it's, it's like um, Nick and Nicholas were speaking. So I was kind of thinking about the, the, the term like fairness and like bias and stuff, those, those kinds of things that often come up in the machine learning world. And, and hopefully maybe that's what maybe that's what like Nick and Nicholas, you guys were kind of like alluding to um, potentially like in our algorithm. So in the end, we build algorithms based on data, but if your data is biased, then your algorithm is going to be biased as well. So I think um, paying attention to your data um, looking at it with the help of domain experts, right? It's, it's kind of really useful. Um, and then, like, and to Nicholas's point, like, you can build a model and you deploy it, but it doesn't mean that's the end of the story. You've got to kind of keep keep an eye on it, right? You can keep monitoring and see what it's doing, what kind of decisions it's making, um, and then being able to kind of like monitor that and then course correct if we see any abnormality. Right? That's kind of important as well. Well, thank you. That was a really dynamic answer. Um, We've spent a lot of time in this conversation so far talking about the challenges of AI in the nonprofit space. I think we'd like to, to flip it for a second here and instead talk about what some of the unique opportunities for AI in nonprofits may be. You're all here because you share in the vision of using AI for a better world. What does that look like for you? I, I, I can go first this time. Um... No, I, so I think, um, and so I'm relatively new to the nonprofit world, and I think this seems to me that like, I mean, AI is being used so much in the for-profit world for many different things, and and therefore it's from a very kind of like very high level uh, uh, perspective. There's just there's so many opportunities just just at that level, saying, hey, the AI, AI has been used for so many different things in the for-profit world. Uh, and and to think Nick made that comment like the problems aren't that different than the nonprofit world. So basically, kind of use the same kinds of things for to solve these kinds of problems, which actually have real impact and touch people's lives and improve people's lives and such. So that's just from that perspective. I think the opportunities are just kind of enormous, right? And then each of us is working with different working different organizations, kind of focusing on different kinds of problems. So. Um, they just go deep in that space and see how much you can actually kind of like um, help, right? So in our world, it's like how do we connect lenders to our borrowers and how do you, um, so we kind of think of us as a marketplace. We, you hear of a marketplace in the for-profit world, you have like Amazon, you have eBay, you have Uber, all of these are marketplaces, right? So we have a marketplace as well. So how do I kind of take learnings from the for-profit world, right? And then apply it to the non-profit world uh, with, with, with the impact as the, as the, as the measure, right? Um, so I'll just kind of leave it at that, kind of come, can come back to it, but love to kind of hear like Nicholas and Nick talk about it as well. I think that makes sense. And I would, I would add like, so the, the, the problems are not like um, specifically different. And I think the deep, so like you said, I mean, like the, there has been obviously like more usage and applications in the, in the for-profit world. And that makes, that creates like a huge opportunities for nonprofits really, because like a lot of the, um, a lot of the impactful things we can do are not out of reach, you know. Like there's a lot of low, lower hanging fruits, in my in my opinion, uh, things that that take time and that you need to build. But in, at the end of the day, like are somehow accessible and maybe more accessible now than if you want to refine things in the in the for profit world, uh, and that can translate into like huge uh, huge impact. I mean, my field is healthcare, but that applies to like every other nonprofit field really like you can just uh dig into somehow like taking advantage of existing data and without a need for necessarily like the most complicated solution in the world i think you can create uh we can quickly create impact yeah i agree with that i think the there's a lot of kind of generalized fear about oh will machine learning you know push out the roles of humans in, in different systems. And I, I think to the contrary, particularly in the social sector, uh, where there's a lot of opportunity for AI and machine learning is to magnify limited human resources, you know, to kind of supercharge what those small teams are capable of. 
uh, you know, for better and for worse, you know, if you pardon a clumsy analogy, it's a, imagine you've got a bunch of trees that you're trying to clear out of your yard and you go from using, you know, a little hatchet to using a chainsaw. Like the chainsaw is going to make you, the individual human, much more efficient at clearing, clearing all the trees out of your yard. It's also potentially, if you're not careful, uh, going to be more likely that you'll hurt yourself. And so I think in the hands of people with those domain expertise, you know, with the domain expertise, with the relationships, uh, with the technological knowledge, uh, that's where I see a lot of the opportunity is in making the people who are already working on the problems able to solve specific pieces of those problems much more efficiently and at much greater scale, such that that, that then freeing up of human resources, of brain power, of money, uh, expands the opportunities then for those people and those teams to make an even greater impact. Great. Thank you, everyone. It was very exciting to hear what you all think are the opportunities for AI, because to your point, Nick, um, I do think that there can be fear around um, that AI is going to take over everything, but there really are a lot of opportunities to use it for good. And it was great hearing you all share that. Um, I wanted to move on to some questions about your individual projects and your individual uh, thoughts on AI. I wanted to start with Pradeep uh, and just ask, what was Kiva's experience with AI? Uh, and did Data Robot help uh, accelerate that uh, adoption? Yeah, so um, so I started Kiva like in some mid-2019, and that's when basically data science and um, machine learning basically started. So be before that, we had like a strong analytics kind of team, a lot of like data-driven decisions happening, but not much machine learning happening. So um, so that's when things started. Um, so when, when we came in, so we had a, a kind of a roadmap that we had kind of, we, we started to work on. We wanted to kind of figure out a way to kind of like say, um, recommend loans to our lenders based on their lending history and such. So, so we had like problems we want to we wanted to solve, and we we started kind of working towards it. Uh, but with Dare Robot, I kind of the way we kind of thought about it was like a, here's a complementary kind of like path for us to kind of like kind of there are these other problems we want to also kind of get at the problem that we specifically solved with like Dare Robot, the idea of looking at um, like I said the loans that don't fund it can be kind of like have a parallel kind of like a um, uh, way to kind of like solve these kinds of problems that we hadn't started looking at on our roadmap yet, right? So we had these few problems in front of us, we were trying to solve this. And here's an opportunity for us um, to work with the robot. And I wanna say it was not just the platform, I think the cool things we got access to like a bunch of like uh, folks here on the, I mean, a couple of whom are on the call here, like the idea of like, uh, brainstorming with them, identifying the problem, uh, figure out how, figuring out how we would solve it. So from that perspective, we were able to kind of accelerate that process, like of like solving this specific problem we did. So um, yeah, that, that's what happened. So we basically kind of had the robot as a complementary kind of like a platform to what we were already kind of doing. That's great, thank you. Um, and as a follow-up uh, question, what does the future of AI look like at your organization? What what is on the roadmap for Kiva when it comes to AI? Yeah, so um, so there's a lot of things to be solved. I mean, like I said, I mean the the, the, the problem is always like uh, the resourcing set of things. So having said that, I think um, what we are trying to do in general is to kind of personalize the experience for our lenders. So we're trying to kind of inject personalization into our lenders' uh, experience. So things like recommendation engines, personalized search. So these are kinds of things that are on our roadmap that we can do along, that we're gonna keep trying to solve. There are also other kinds of problems um, where we wanna kind of, let's say in, in general, like try to predict user behavior. Like how likely is a user to kind of do these kinds of things, like say lend or like come back again, or like um, subscribe to our subscription product. So there are all these kinds of problems that also are waiting to be solved and, um, the hope is like yeah, we can kind of solve all of them uh, with the help of data robot as well. So you're currently in the place of kind of developing out uh, a roadmap of use cases. Yeah, so there's like tons of things to be solved. Like you've got to figure out like which ones to solve first and then ones later. So the typical problem of just roadmapping, yeah. Well, thank you, Pradeep. Um, 
Nicholas, I wanted to ask you about your team's experience with what we call data robot self-service. Um, so that's a, there were kind of two AI for good programs, one the cohort program that Pradeep was a, one of the original members of. Um, and then you, Virtue Foundation came in through self-service and got hands-on directly with the data robot platform with your use case. Can you describe what that process was like? Yeah, so we came in at a time where we we were facing a tight deadline in terms of like enabling um, publication for that first edition of our uh, compendium of uh, healthcare nonprofits. Um, and we came in at a time where we realized that we were going to have like a lot more um, review work, like a, lot, a, a huge pile of like new organizations uh, that we we captured that we now needed to review and assess like is this uh, a healthcare nonprofit or is this not right? Um, we had our like historical label data of like several tens of thousands of uh, uh, organizations that had already been labeled like as healthcare nonprofit or not, um, and this is where data came into came into play. So like we. We were able to quickly benchmark and build like uh, um, a successful model that takes like uh, that basically takes website contents as input and from the, from there like makes a prediction as to whether um, a nonprofit is um, is um, I mean w whether or not the, the website sorry belongs to a, a healthcare nonprofit or not uh, and I think I mean we did that in a matter of. Um, a week basically like like turning turning our historical data into a model that we that we used um to make basically that to to make that project possible in the previous year otherwise i think it would have taken more time uh and yeah it was a matter of a week not a matter of weeks but a matter of months we're able to like create a lot of value out of the data we already had um and i think data was a great accelerator in in um for us, like for just enabling to continue building that platform. A lot of the problems we're facing now are, um, I mean, we're obviously continuing to uh, expand the platform, rolling out uh, a, a volunteer matching tool, like if you're a healthcare professional uh, and you're looking for the most relevant opportunities, like where, where can you go? So this is what we're rolling out this year. And so there's further work of data curation um, uh, onwards. But last year, data was basically, I think, in terms of uh, facilitating our work with the resource we had, enabled us to make that first uh, milestone. That's a remarkable story. Could you take a moment just to elaborate on the impact of that use case? What is the purpose yeah. of the healthcare compendium? Yeah, so the, the, the healthcare compendium is not an end in itself. It's, a, it's the way we look at it, a necessary step, right? So there is like uh, not a lot of quality data available uh, as to what organizations exist out there what healthcare organizations exist out there and what do they do exactly in terms of healthcare services, in terms of countries of activity, in terms of other areas of activity. So not just to like have a, to know that there is an organization that, you know, like basic contact information or like very high level field, but rather like granular in-depth information. And uh, this we, we can use to match um, physicians like or, or other healthcare professionals with the most relevant opportunities on the ground. Let's say you have, uh, you, you know, you're, you're, you're a physician, you have uh, two specific, two very specific specialties and you wonder where can I go to, you know, like to put my skills in practice and have the most impact. There is no uh, universal sol way to answer that question today. And so curating that high, high, high quality and like exhaustive data uh, and expanding in terms of, I mean, starting with 24 low, low income countries, expanding to lower and middle uh, income countries as per the, the World Bank classification and moving moving forward and at the same time curating that data, which is, you know, it's, it's, it's a necessary tool, but not an end in itself. And in parallel to that, building uh, the platform to enable the matching to happen and, and make that data effectively available to the public uh, with, with two, sub, two sub segments, one being uh, matching volunteers with opportunities and one being uh raising awareness like saying hey so this region is like severely under equipped in terms of uh in terms of um bed capacity in terms of infrastructure it may be a prime uh, target for uh, intervention especially given that there has been a new uh, condition developing locally so these are kind of like our different uh, uh verticals for impact 
So would you say this healthcare compendium kind of represented, you've discussed that there's low hanging fruit still available in the nonprofit space, things that can be automated, um, data that can be processed quickly for value. Is that one of those use cases in your mind? Um, so it would be, it's, it's, I wouldn't qualify like the healthcare companion or low hanging fruit because there is like substantial uh, resource uh, and uh, curation to be put in. I mean, it's, it took uh, it took more than uh, than a year to build. Uh, but now that we have it, there are like uh, low hanging fruits. Like we can just like basically start with like simple matching, making that data available, enabling people to. Um, to search like by specialties, by combinations of specialties, uh, combinations of regions, just making that data available to the public in a form that is uh, user friendly, uh, in my opinion, is a low hanging fruit. And this is what we're building uh, right now um, and can have like substantial impact into just connecting the right people with the right organizations. And then obviously we're iterating on top of that with the, the next uh, data milestone being um, to establish a relationship between uh, healthcare facilities and especially hospitals and uh, nonprofits to have like kind of a um, a, a global graph of uh, of organizations and facilities and so to basically represent like through which um, facilities organizations are providing care uh, on the ground which in itself will offer like other opportunities as to um, um raise awareness and like maximize uh, impact that's great thank you nicholas um very exciting to hear what you guys were able to accomplish in in a relatively short time period so i'd like to move on to uh some questions for you nick um with the rise of uh crowdfunding and social media the reach that nonprofits has has drastically changed uh, in, in even the last 10, 20 years. So what are the ways that you have seen technology and AI affect the ways that nonprofits operate, uh, including uh, the way that they raise funding, the ways that they uh, uh, pursue their operations? Um, looking for your thoughts there. Yeah, I think one of the big ways that technology has kind of shifted the way that organizations get access to funding is in terms of the reach that they are able to have and the sources from which they are able to draw. Uh, it's easy to, I think, for today's world where like there's there's lots of different platforms, you know, there's all manner of social media opportunities. Like you you can connect with pretty much anyone anytime you want. It was, you know, less than two at the moment of Global Giving's founding. Uh, that's not uh, when the typical, like, if you wanted to get money from these, you had to go through major entities like, like the World Bank, like the UN, like the IMF. Uh, it, small organizations uh, getting access to funding from regular people, uh, people like you and me, that's that's a relatively new concept that technology has directly facilitated. And with that has come, uh, and it continues to, to come, a kind of shift from this very top-down prescriptive approach to international aid and development to, to one that is more bottom-up and one that can be driven more by the, uh, the communities who are actively doing the work. And so, the, the aspect of connection, I think, is is one that's really important. And in terms of how that actually happens operationally, I think that's where you find these little nuggets of AI and technology that come into, like we were saying earlier, really accelerate the speed and scale at which that process can operate. So, for example, uh, uh, on global giving, you know, we have we have a website where people can come to donate to no to nonprofits. Uh, that's very cool, but like any other e-commerce websites out there, that means that occasionally we'll get bad actors who come to us to try and see if stolen credit cards will work, for example. And so protecting against credit card fraud becomes a really important piece of operational glue that 10, 20 years ago would be extremely difficult to do at scale. Nowadays, uh, we're able to use AI tools and technology to help 
magnify the impact that, that we can have uh, to keep our partners safe, keep our donors safe, and still facilitate uh, increased scale at operations that we need uh, ultimately to grow the impact that they're all able to have. So I think there's, I think it's really in the connection and in the, the operational capacity of the sector where we've seen that shift in what uh, the technology and AI has been able to facilitate. Yeah, that's an excellent point on the credit card fraud example. Um, really, these are things that we're able to do now uh, with with so much greater ease than we could do um, 20 years ago. I mean, to your point, that would have been a very difficult thing to do. Um, so global giving helps companies uh, give back to the community. What are some of the best ways that companies can give and help nonprofits? Uh, yeah, we we love working with companies uh, to help connect them with nonprofits all around the world, and we do that in many different ways. Uh, it can be in uh, in terms of you know, facilitating programs, programs like the AI, Data Robot AI for Good program, uh, where we might help companies uh, vet the organizations that they're about to make grants to, or facilitate the grant management of those kinds of uh, those kind of programs. We also uh, companies to uh, do things like set up gift card programs. Uh, lots of companies, instead of giving out, you know, a, a gift basket full of cookies at the holidays, maybe want to give a gift that's a little bit more meaningful. And so that we can work with them to say, instead of sending a gift basket, here's fifty dollars, a hundred dollars to give to a nonprofit that speaks to you. Um, that can be a great way both to engage with employees, but also support organizations all around the world uh, with really very little operational overhead uh, by virtue of working with a, with us uh, we're able to make those connections so that companies don't have to that can be a really good way to give back uh, the other one that I would be remiss if I didn't mention is is disaster response I think the um, you know certainly the last year uh, has has reminded us uh, just of the scale of challenges that can happen when things things go wrong. And so companies, uh, I think, tend to want to react to disasters that affect them and their employees and their audiences in different ways. And that can mean a lot of different things. Uh, it can also vary a lot event to event. You know, a, a pandemic is a very different kind of situation than an earthquake or a tsunami. And so, uh, again, being able to connect with the organizations that are on the ground that are based in communities that are affected and are going to be there for the long term uh, that's a really effective way for companies to help uh, support persistent uh, sustainable disaster relief and recovery and that's that's exactly what we like to help uh, companies do great thank you nick so that is it for questions um I wanted to open it up and see if uh, the panel had any last comments they'd like to share. Oh, I just want to kind of go back to like the, the, the robot on the AI for good program part of it. So the idea of like accelerating, right, using the platform. So I just going to add a little bit of color there. So so that for us, like I think with the the, the data robot platform, um, from the platform from the platform perspective the idea that you can kind of upload a data set, right? And then you automatically have a tool that kind of like profiles the data, kind of, kind of helps you kind of look at the data from a, from a data quality perspective, like look at holes in the data and such. So that secondly, kind of like um, surface up potential like correlations that you can exploit to build models, right? Just having that, so you get a login, you get into the platform, you can upload a data set and you get this right away, right? Um, that's one piece of it. It kind of accelerates a lot of your data science work, right? To kind of just kind of have that available to you. Um, the other second piece is like the the what thing you guys call it, or the auto ML piece of it, where like the robot already kind of runs through I don't know 50, 100 different algorithms for you on that data set after you and all the profiling and stuff. So I, from my perspective, from a from a product perspective, you can think like, hey, if I want to build an MVP kind of machine learning algorithm, here's a way to pick the best MVP because you already have like 50 algorithms that have been run through and ranked for you in order of 
let's say performance or whatever it, whatever the metric you're interested in. Um, and then finally, the piece around deployment where like an API is available now for you to kind of consume predictions from the model. So I just want to kind of share a little bit about that saying that to, that kind of helps you really accelerate your process, right? Of like actually going from like data to, uh, to predictions, right? Um, and then finally, kind of going back to the idea of like for, specifically for the AI for good program, having access to a team from Data Robot that kind of helps you through that process, right? Um, yeah, so just want to kind of share that 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 piece of it, and like uh, thanks to the team for 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 the help there. Thank you, Pradeep. We are really happy to have worked with you, uh, and we look forward to all the great things that can come out of our partnership. Any other comments from the group? Uh, okay. I don't have anything else to add, but uh, yeah, thank you all for a great conversation. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I mean. Our experience has been like like similar to what uh, Pradeep described, like basically like just like incredible um, speed and ability to like prototype quickly, and then once you have like something that that actually looks good, you you don't it doesn't take weeks to turn it into something you can start uh, using in production. Like you can deploy with, with a couple of clicks, uh, and that's been that's been I mean especially when you have limited resource, that's been a game changer, like as to the ability to um, to give it a try and like you don't have to spend like a day, sometimes you just have an idea or something that comes up. Uh, will this work? Will this not? I mean, I don't have to choose if uh, I'm gonna allocate a week of time to it, I can just give it a go. And this is what Data Robot like, has been uh, a game changer for us. That's great to hear, thank you. We love hearing about how Data Robot helps uh, accelerate the machine learning development pipeline. All right, well, that was it for today's session. Thank you everyone for joining. We really appreciate you participating in this conversation. As a reminder, applications for round two of the AI for Good program are open. You can apply on our website using the link in the meeting description. And um, that's a wrap, thanks everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so Thank much. you. Thank you.